And between the two bunk beds, that's the way you would walk. She says, with a big Muppet's mouth. Have you ever watched Muppets? They have a mouth from ear to ear. When they talk, the whole head moves. I am blessed. I have a job. I make $14 a month. One for 14. That's unnormal for our society. Talking about that church member, rich guy, good man, faithful SDA, tithe paying, Sabbath keeping, broccoli eating. I'm not saying that we should not plan. But instead of seeking God's blessing for our plan, we should seek God's plan. Because when you get God's plan, you get his resources and his blessings. I cannot imagine uh, Joshua making a plan how to take Jericho. <laughs> I cannot imagine Gideon making a plan how to fight the other army. I cannot imagine Jehoshaphat making a plan to battle with several nations that united against Israel. I could not imagine Moses making a plan to deliver Israel. I could not imagine Noah making a plan to save the world. If you really want God's blessing, you need to seek God's plan and God's presence. The secret for personal growth and our family growth and our church growth and saving others around us, having a powerful influence... It's not so much what we believe, though we do have the truth. What we believe is biblical, is nobody's invention. So uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about against our doctrines. Sabbath or no, 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 no. Don't get it in a wrong way, I don't mean that. But I did say that if we know the doctrines and we keep them, but if we don't leave them, whatever we say has no power. That's what I said, you remember? Basically, you can preach to your neighbor forever. Unless you show them that type of kindness that Jesus showed, your word will never have power. You remember what I said? So I'm not preaching a charity gospel. Just help the poor, uh, dress the naked, and that's it. Jesus didn't come to give people comfort in this life. He came to give them eternal life. He didn't give his life that we may have food when we miss it. He gave his life that we may have eternal life. But Ellen White, when she says Christ method alone, she means, and she has, if you read the whole chapter, she says that people will never open the heart. They will never be open until we build some bridges and build some friendship and some trust. And that's what I said when I said, instead of praying so much for self, why don't you spend more time praying for others? Because when you pray for others and you start caring for others, that's when God can actually use you. And I said, instead of focusing so much on your needs, why don't you love your neighbor just as you love yourself? That means when you buy shoes for you, literally buy shoes for your neighbor. I told you what my wife did. Not that my wife is a saint, though she is a saint. But anyway, <laughs> when you harvest your garden, why don't you go and give some tomatoes and some cucumbers and some peppers to your neighbor and say, hey, I got so much from my garden, I want to share. When you make a bread, why don't you make two breads and give one to the neighbor? Because that's how you gain access. You open a door. And after you do that a few times, you say, let me pray for you. And you listen, I said, you listen. Because in our society, nobody cares to listen anymore. You listen. And after they open their heart and tell you what they struggle with, you pray for them. Not necessarily tell them about state of the dead. You pray for them. And after you do that a few times, and they understand that you do care, then you pray for an opportunity to share the good news. Because that's the goal. The goal is not just to give them a bread. You follow me? But that's the way to go. Well, let me give you an example. You probably heard it on the internet. I was in Cuba many times. Many times. And one of the times... A lady brought to evangelism every night about 150, 200, 250, some nights even more, kids and some of their parents. Now the whole church brought, let's say, 20 visitors. That lady would bring 200, 250, 180. I said, what do you tell them? And she said to me, and she shook her head, Pastor, and the translator, Jorge, was next, you know, next to me, and she would translate, Pastor, 
It's not what you say, it's what you do, pastor. Uh, okay, what do you do then? She says, well, it's too much to explain. Come tomorrow at 2 o'clock and visit me. <laughs> okay, tomorrow I took the pastor with me. I never go alone to visit a lady. I took the pastor with me. At 2 o'clock we went there. I have pictures. If you see the pictures, my shed is really good looking compared to her house. Plywood covered with some pieces of steel that were rusted and kind of old new ones put over the old ones. A mess. One time somewhere in Kentucky, I saw somebody having that type of shed where they kept pigs under. That lady, her house was from this laptop to here and from this wall to here. Literally smaller than my, walking, my wife's walking closet. Literally smaller. Smaller than my shed where I keep my gardening tools. She had in the left side a bunk bed that was two levels. In the, in the other side, a bunk bed that was three levels for the kids, for her and her husband, and her parents. And between the two bunk beds, that's the way you would walk. And then it was a round, small table, three legs handmade table. I've never seen that. With three small, three legs handmade chairs and a small camping stove with a small propane tank, and that was the whole house. And around 2 o'clock, I would say way over 300 kids came. And she asked them to sit in front of the house on dirt. And she said to them, before you eat today, I want your papers signed by the parents. I said, what papers? Uh, she said, just wait and watch. Let me feed them, and then while they eat, I can explain it. They gave the papers, and then they stood in a line. And they would take a bowl, and she would put a spoon of rice, next, spoon of rice, next, until they all got rice. And then they sat down and started to eat. It was not a spoon, it was something like a bigger scoop. I don't know how you call it in English. Not important, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> While they ate, she told me, she says, with a big Muppet's mouth, have you wa ever watched Muppets? They have a mouth from ear to ear when they tuck, the whole head moves. <laughs> with a small, with a big Muppet's mouth, she said, happy, visible happy. I am blessed. I have a job. I make $14 a month. One for 14. I make $14 a month. These neighbors don't have a job. They don't have food. God bless me to be able to feed the whole neighborhood. She didn't say, God bless me to have my refrigerator or my freezer filled. And uh, you follow me? God bless me. Gave me the joy and the privilege and the happiness to feed my neighborhood. And she said, Pastor, you cannot believe the privilege and the blessing that I experience when I see these kids fed. And she said, but Jesus didn't come just to give them food. He wants them in heaven. He died so they will be in heaven. How could I get to their parents when they are either Catholics or atheists, communists? How could I get to them? They will never listen to me if I call them to evangelism or to a Bible study. But they will listen to their kids. That's the best way in their homes. So what I do, I tell the kids, because kids don't listen to my Bible stories. They start talking and playing and get distracted. So I tell them, I want you to prove that you listen. So I want you to listen to the story and learn the story and the song. Every day you should tell them a Bible story and the song. And you go home and to prove that you paid attention, I want you to tell the story to your parents <laughs> and to sing the song. And if they sign on a piece of paper that you did remember, you can come tomorrow and eat rice again. If not, you cannot come tomorrow. <laughs> and she says, I have the kids evangelize the parents. And she said, I have been praying for my neighbors for months. I didn't know how to get to them. And God inspired me, feed them, and then evangelize the kids. And she says, it was through prayer that I was inspired. And she says, that's what I do. And then they came for seconds, and then she taught them the Bible story, and then she taught them the song. I remember specifically, it was Noah and the flood. And then the kids, before leaving, would jump and kiss her. 
And she told me, Pastor, this is a blessing. And then next night, again, the church was packed with kids and parents. I told her, what, what can I do to, to help you? She said, well, there is nothing. God is already doing it. He gave me a salary. <laughs> I said, I want to help your ministry to be a blessing for you. She says, Pastor, the more I help them, the more blessed I am. Mm-hmm. And I said, I don't have cash usually, but I do have a $50 bill. Take it. She looked in the sun. I've never seen so much money in my life. I cannot take it. She gave it back. I talked to the treasurer and I talked to some people and I sent a good amount of money to cover not only food for several months for the kids, but I asked the treasurer, what does she need? Songbooks. Okay, how much it is? Oh, about $42, all of them, for all the kids. What else? Pathfinder's costumes. How much? Oh, it's about 20 some dollars for all of them. Okay. <laughs> you, un- you understand the value of money there, you know? Anyway, uh, what impressed me the most is that she was happy to bless others. And we wonder why we are not happy. I could give you quotations that I said I will not give you anymore, but anyway. (laughs) Look here. Our petitions to God should proceed from hearts filled with, not, not filled with selfish aspirations, but rather petitions to be a blessing for others. Another one. In our petitions, we are to include our neighbors as much as we include ourselves. No one would pray right seeking a blessing for himself alone. SD 267. Let me give you another one. Our prayers are not to be selfish, asking for our own benefit. We may ask only in order to give. The principle of Christ's life might be in our principle in our lives. The same devotion, the same sacrifice, the same subjection to the claims of the word of God that were manifest in Christ must be seen in his servants. We are called to serve, not to be served. We are to ask blessing from God, not for self, but that we may communicate to others. The capacity for receiving is preserved only by imparting. We cannot continue to receive blessings without communicating them to those around us. Christ's object object lesson 142. And I do have a whole page of quotations like that. I'm not going to read more. But these are the means that would open doors that otherwise would not open. When we really show care in a self-centered, hateful, divided society, we show care and love and unity. That's unnormal for our society. That talks about Christ living in us. It's not enough to talk about God. The time is here that we need to live like God. You follow me? What if every SDA member would pray for the neighbors and be a blessing for the neighbors? That would speak better than any sermon. Well, let me give you another example. I had a friend, not going to tell you where or who, who was very well to do. He was an elder. He was a MK, missionary kid. His father was a missionary for over 31 years, a little over 31 years. And this friend, very well to do, When I talked to the church and I said, you need to be a missionary, whatever God put you. Ellen White says, and I gave you the quotation last night, not everyone can go in foreign lands, she says, but everyone must be a missionary in his neighborhood. And in fact, she is very strong when she says that. She is extremely strong. It's like, if you listen to the quotations, God has called every church member to serve Everyone in A Testimonies, page 47. <clears throat> God expects personal service from everyone. Not all can be missionary in their uh, foreign lands, but they all should be missionaries in their families and neighborhoods. Christian service, page 9. Every true disciple is born in God's kingdom as a missionary. He who drinks from the living water must become a fountain of water. The receiver must become a giver. You, you remember the quotation, don't you? Desire of Ages 184. Now listen, those that have been truly converted would work to save others. 
And those who don't work, they have never been converted. Whoa! That's pretty strong, isn't it? The very life of the church depends on the faithfulness of the members to the Great Commission. To neglect the Great Commission is to invite spiritual feebleness and decay and death in the church and personal spiritual life. Wow! Love for Jesus, if it's honest, will be manifested in the desire to save the lost. Yeah. We'll be willing to make any possible sacrifice that others that Christ died for may be saved. And I could go on and on. Wherever a church is established, all the members should active, actively engage in missionary work in the neighborhoods. They should visit every family in the neighborhood, pray for them, and check their spiritual condition. Testimonies for Church, volume 6, page 296. The real character of the church is measured not by the theory, not by the high profession she makes, not by the names and only the church books, but by doing the work of the master, saving the lost. Mm -hmm. Review and Herald, September 6, 1881. It's not what you talk, it's not the scumbaya that we sing. Are you working for the lost? That shows if you are a Christian. But let me not read this God, God's church it's the God's appointed, the church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of lost. It was organized for service. The mission is to carry the gospel to the world. From the beginning, it has been God's plan that the church should be reflect, should reflect his character to the lost. The members should show his marvelous light and his glory to a fallen world. And I could go on and on. This, you know, it's just a bunch of quotations, a bunch of them. If we want to grow spiritually, we must carry the burdens of others. Otherwise, we'll never grow. These are powerful quotations. And so, talking about that church member, rich guy, good man, faithful SDA, tight paying, Sabbath keeping, broccoli eating, all of the above. <laughs> good guy. Every time we had a, 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 an evangelism, a, an action, a work be, he was always supportive. When I talked about reaching the lost, I said, if you really want to measure your love for God, you need to measure your love for your neighbor. Unless you really have a passion for the lost, you may think you love God, but you actually may not know that you don't love God. It's just a theory. Because that's what Jesus says. Lord, we have been going to church. We did miracles. We did evangelism and care meetings. I don't know you. I was in prison and you didn't visit me. Now, good people don't go to prison. By the way, let me tell you another story within this story. A few weeks ago, I got a phone call from somewhere in Carolina. And he is a pastor friend of mine. He says, Pavel, I know that you know that city. I don't know anybody there. There is a Romanian in jail there. Would you send somebody to visit him? And I said, tell me more. Well, this guy is not an Adventist. He came from Romania with his parents. They immigrated here. His parents went back for one month visit to visit the grandparents. He's alone. And he has a tendency to speed. And he has got so many speeding tickets that you cannot count them. And the judge took his license away. And he drove without a license, speeding. And they caught him and put him in jail. And being in jail, he called me and says, call this pastor from Carolina. I am alone. I don't know anybody in this country. I'm sorry for what I did. I don't know how to fix it. I really want to change my life. I'm so afraid. I'm so alone. Would you send somebody from the church to pray for me? And he, he was crying, I beg you, please send somebody to pray for me. I don't care if he deserves it or not. Nobody deserves anything. But Jesus says, I was in prison and you didn't come. And they Lord, what have we seen you in prison? Whenever you didn't do it to them, you didn't do it to me. Because those are my kids, my children. Yeah. I love them. So, as a good pastor, I call people from that location. Hey, can you go and visit somebody in prison? Pastor, I would love to, but I'm so busy. I'm sorry. I don't have time. Okay, next. Can you? Pastor, oh, that's a nice thing to do, but I cannot do it. it it's going to take me about two months until I find room in my schedule. I call the next one. The next one, I called four of them. Then I call the pastor. Absolutely, sure. Uh, maybe Sunday. I don't know. 
I said, man, can you go today or tomorrow? No, no, no. And I said, Saturday morning, do you preach? Yes. During Sabbath school, can you go? Oh, no, it's a sin to miss Sabbath school. It's not a sin not to visit in prison. It's a sin to miss Sabbath school. I cannot miss Sabbath school. That's, I'm the pastor. I said, after church. Oh, after the church, we have some activities. And then I take my family in nature. I said, okay, man. Why would you even go to church yeah. if you don't have a heart to care for the lost? Yeah. So going back to this rich man, he talked to me when I said, you need to pray for people more than you pray for yourself. Because if you really love God, you love people. And I said, you need to make God a priority, not yourself. God should come above you. Start seeking God more than you seek God's blessings. You need to put God first, and then you and your neighbor. Because you need to love God with everything, and love your neighbor just as you love yourself. And I said, that's how you show that you really care for God. And so, when I preach that, by the way, you don't preach one sermon and expect changes. It takes a few months of preaching the same sermon with different Bible verses and different stories. And people would come to me and say, wow, we never heard that before. We need to act on it. <laughs> it takes time for people to understand and then to make a decision and act on it. And so he came to me after about six months of preaching on our commission, our reason to exist. And so I told him, I said, you tell me that it's not possible to do it? It is possible. Pastor, you don't know. I live in a very, 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 very affluent neighborhood. Around me are only millionaires. They are very private. They will not listen to you or to me. They will never come to evangelism or to a Bible study. They will never talk to you or to me. There is no way to reach these people. And I said, my friend, God doesn't have a harvest problem. God has a worker's problem. Rich people have diabetes as poor people have diabetes. Rich people have depression as poor people have depression. Rich people have divorce as poor people have divorce. Rich people, uh, you understand what I need salvation as poor people need salvation. The problem is not that rich don't need it. The problem is that we don't know how to approach them. We use the same uh, antidote to every sick pe person. It's like you go to a doctor, doesn't matter if you have headaches, or you broke your leg, they still give you the same medicine. That doesn't work. That's what we do. So I told him, it's your fault. You don't pray for them. Oh, I do pray for them. I said, how long? Well, I don't know. That means you don't pray. <laughs> why do you say that? Tell me how long you pray for them. I don't know. Then you don't pray. Pastor, why do you say that? Very simple. When you fast, one minute you don't know. When you fast three days, trust me, you do know. When you pray two seconds, you don't know. If you pray three months for your neighbors, you do know. Commit three months, half an hour every morning. Either in home or walk and pray house by house. Men, I mean husband, wife, children, pray for each family. And he says, you want me to wake up half an hour early and pray for each one for half an hour? Yes. I'm not sure I have that time. That means that you don't love them. Oh, well, I do love them. No, you don't. You just like to say, oh, 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 how much I love you. Happy Sabbath. Oh, let me give you a hug. Yeah. Hugs are wonderful, but that doesn't mean that you love somebody. We think because we hug each other and say happy Sabbath, it means we love one another. Show me what you do for your neighbor, and then I tell you how much you love him. And so I said, you don't love them. So you're not an Adventist. So why do you come to church? To misrepresent Jesus? Oh, pastor, you are rough. I said, yes. He said, what do you want me to do? Pray for them. And this is how you pray for them. Lord, I am ready to give my life if you would save my neighbor. I am willing, as Jesus gave up his life, do whatever it takes. I am willing to sacrifice anything, including my life, if you would save one person from my neighborhood. He looked at me and says, I'm not sure I can say that in prayer. I said, that means you don't love them. When you love your kids, don't you say, Lord, whatever it takes, save my life, but save my kid. Don't you do that? That's for somebody that you love. That's what Moses did. Didn't he? That's what Paul did. 
I have quotations that certify that. He was quiet. And then he said, I know you are right, but that's kind of hard. Well, then ask God to put his divine love in your heart because human love is dirty. And he says, how do you do that? Very simple. You pray and ask God for help and you start praying for the neighbors. And the more you invest praying for them, the more you start caring for them. And you pray that God would give you the method because whatever you apply here doesn't apply there. Principle is the same. Methods are different. I said to him, can you commit to that? Half an hour a day, three months. He was arguing, how did you pick three months? Why not two? Why not four? I said, okay, do two, <laughs> but start somewhere. Why do you say half an hour? Come on, man, you can pray 15 minutes, but start somewhere. Oh, okay. He started. About one, two months later, he called me. And he said, Pastor, I've been an Adventist all my life. My father, my grandfather, I'm a fourth generation Adventist. And he said to me, I'm faithful. I thought I love God. I thought I know God. But it is first time in my life when I actually started to experience God. He said, I would hear you telling stories. And I didn't even know if I should believe you or not. Since I prayed that way, I started to have stories. And he says to me, he said, I sense when God would impress me to do something. And when I obey, I have a story. And when I don't obey, it's a mess. And I started to distinguish God's voice when he would impress me through his spirit to do something, when, what, how, whatever. And he said, I started to understand what it means to walk with God. I started to understand the song, and he walks with me and he talks. We just sing it, we don't leave it. And he said to me, the more I do it, the more I experience God in ways that I've never experienced before. And I started to understand that we as a church so many times are so far from what God wants us to be. I'm not talking about the church. Let's blame the church. The church is not the institution. It's you and me, the people. Don't expect, when the church is going to change, then I change. You are the church. You follow me? And so he said to me, not only that I see results, but I started to see blessings in my family. Every time I spend time in prayer, my kids behave differently. I said, absolutely, because when you pray, God's presence is there. Satan has less access to your family. Ellen White says that every morning is the duty of the parents to invite God's presence in their family. I could give you the quotations. I have a bunch of them. Anyway, going back, he said, I am praying for my neighbors. I want you to come and pray with me for them once in a while. I said, okay, deal. If you pray, hey, I join you. Many people expect the pastor to pray. Pastor, would you pray for this? Would you pray? Who told you that you should not pray? Let the pastor pray for you. You pray. Hello? God loves you just as much as he loves the pastor. And so I said, okay, I'm going to visit you. Well, it was a hundred years ago. I had a Kia Rio, not the way Kias are right now. In 2003, 2004, a Kia was like Mr. Bean's car, you know. It was a <laughs> matchbox that you keep your niece in your mouth, you know. It was blue. I have pictures with it. Small car. My wife hit it when she got into the garage on the right side. My father-in-law was hit by a bus in the left side. A friend of mine from Spain backed into a truck and bent the trunk. It was all beaten, junky. The covers from the rotors, from the brakes, were bent, touching the rotors. So when the wheel would turn, you would hear... And when I would come to the church, Sabbath morning, they would hear... Ah, the pastor is here. I took my Kia Rio, my junk, went to visit this guy. Homes around the lake, big homes, gigantic, beautiful mansions. I got to an exclusive neighborhood, gates, and the guy into a little booth there. He looks through the window. He says, you are in the wrong neighborhood. <laughs> mm -mm, I'm in the right neighborhood. Let me in. Where do you go? I go to visit so-and-so. Hold on a second. He called my elder. There is a crazy guy in a beaten junk, a Kia. He says that he comes to visit you. Oh, that's my pastor. Let him in. Okay. <laughs> 
in the left side, Maserati, Bentley, Ferrari, Porsche, Lexus, Mercedes. You know, all those amazing cars. I pass by looking to the cars, to the homes. I get to his house. He says, sit down. I've been praying. I want you to know God impress me. I have the answer. I said, okay. His wife from Greece put a beautiful meal, Greek food, Mediterranean salad with kalamata olives. And I could go on and on. And, and, and stuffed cabbage rolls and moussaka and baklava. Oh. I ate until I could not walk, you know. And then he says, Every time somebody eats my wife's food, and I, I forgot to say, I ate and I said, man, this is the best food I had in my life. Your wife should open a restaurant. You guys would be rich. He says, he says, I don't need more money. And then he said to me, everybody that visits us from the church or friends and eat, everybody says you should open a restaurant. When I said that, he said, everybody says that. And God impressed me. He says, my neighbors, rich people, are very private. They will never come to church. But they will drive far away for a good restaurant. So he said, I'm going to invite them over to eat, and I'm going to build friendship with them. Amen. In my mind, when you invite them, invite me too, you know. <laughs> I left. He called me months later, six months or more. He told me the story. Next Sunday, he saw his neighbor cleaning the Porsche or washing the Porsche or something. Good morning. Good morning. Today is our anniversary. My wife and I have 25 years of marriage. Would you come and eat with us so we don't eat alone? Oh, thank you. I am busy. Congratulations. And he said, God impressed me to describe the food. I said, hey, we have this, and we have that, and we have this, and we have uh, stuffed cabbage rolls, and we have moussaka, and we have uh, baklava. And he said, as I was describing the food, the neighbor opened his mouth. And he says, I think I can come a little. <laughs> he came. And my elder says, in my house, nobody eats without prayer. And the guy says, I've never prayed in my life. I, I, I don't like churches and politics and preaching money, and I just, I don't believe in it. Well, that's okay. You don't have to pray. Close your eyes. I pray. <laughs> he closed his eyes. And then my elder says, what do you want me to pray for? Well, I, I don't believe in church, but if, if, if there is a God, my wife and I are separated for five years and our kids, teenagers, don't even talk to us. Would you pray for my family? Rich people have problems. <laughs> Just like poor people. Everybody has problems. Nobody is in heaven yet, you know. <laughs> and so my friend prayed for the food. Pray for the neighbor's family, and then they ate. No doctrines, no state of the dead, you know. And then he said, let's play a game. And the guy says, what? Play a game. We are adults, come on, we don't play games. Why not? When is the last time you had fun? And the guy stops for a second and says, not since I finished college. That's pretty sad. And he said, I come home from work. And I keep working because hundreds of people depend on me. And I keep working in my office until 10, 11 p.m. I don't have time for games. That's the reason you should play a game. So you actually relax. We ate, we play, we relax a little. We enjoy a little. And then you can go back to your stress. No, I don't have time. And he said, God impressed me like Abraham to negotiate. What if there were 45? What if there were 40? And so he said, let's play one hour only. One hour? I don't have one. Okay, 45 minutes. No, come on, man. 30 minutes. No, I don't have... 15 minutes, come on. No, 10 minutes, man. We ate together. Let's play 10 minutes. Are you going to die for... Are you so busy that you cannot take... The okay, 10 minutes and I am out. Okay. And he said we played Settlers of Catan and Monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> and he said... He said to me, Pastor... I can kill them. I can beat anybody. In Monopoly, I'm a killer. I never lose a game. But I let him win. I pretended that I lost the game so he would enjoy it. <laughs> and he wanted to say, I beat you, let's play again. <laughs> and he said, we played three games of Monopoly. I allowed him to win the first and the last. I had to, say, to, to gain one too, in the middle. 
And he said to me, the guy was so happy, and he said to me, I don't remember a day as good as this one. And he said, I finally feel that I live again. And he said, can we do it again sometime? <laughs> Absolutely. Come again next Sunday. Your wife cooks again? Yeah. <laughs> Good. And my elder said to me, he literally left whistling. <laughs> he got in the house. And the kids looked to him, you whistling? We have never seen you whistling. What was wrong with you? And he says, I went to the neighbor, and we ate this, and we ate that, and we ate the baklava, and the cake was out of this world. And then we played games, and I beat him, and the kids, you play games? You have never played with us. You are always busy working. And he said, not only that I played and I won. Next Sunday I go again, and from now on, every Sunday, I'm going to take two hours and have time to relax. And we eat again, and we play again next Sunday. And the kids, dad, sounds like fun. Can I come? <laughs> Let me call him. Can I take my kids? Absolutely. Yes, you can come. <laughs> he goes upstairs. The wife says, the kids talk to you? Yeah. But they don't talk to me. What did you tell them? Did you give them another laptop or a cell phone? No. So I went to the neighbor, and we ate Greek food. And the food, man, the stuffed cabbage rolls and the, the baklava at the end was just heavenly. It would melt in your mouth. And then we played games and I beat him. Next Sunday, the kids come with me. We eat again and play games again. <coughs> His wife says, you play games? You never played in family. You go back next Sunday, I'm coming. <laughs> next Sunday, the whole family. Next Sunday again, next Sunday again, next Sunday again. A few months later, this rich neighbor is playing golf with the next neighbor. And he says, my family is back together. And the guy says, what counselor did you go to? <laughs> he says, no counseling. I went to that guy. <laughs> we go every, every Sunday morning, we eat Greek food, and I tell you, he should open a restaurant, he said. And we eat, and we pray for one another, and, since, and we play games. And since we do that, my family is back together. Amen. And the other neighbor says, you are crazy to pray. It doesn't work. Well, it works for me. Look, my wife and I, we love each other more than when we got married. This is real love. And the guy says, tell me more what you do. Well, this is what we do. Can I come one Sunday to watch it? <laughs> Long story short, six months later when he called me, 11 very rich families were eating together, praying together, and playing together. Amen. 11 rich families. It took time and perseverance and sacrifice and investment and patience. And he says, should I tell them about Sabbath? No. Let them ask for it. And when they ask, be expensive. Tell them no. Let them beg for it. <laughs> they need to be thirsty. Otherwise, they think you had an agenda. So eventually they asked, why are you different? You don't eat this. We have been watching. You, every Saturday morning, get dressed nicely with your kids, suit, tie, and go somewhere. You pray. Your family is excellent. You pray for us. You feed us. What do you believe? And he said, no, no, no. Politics and religion are private. No, we don't talk about it. Please tell us no. Please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I gave him some Bible studies on DVD, and they started to watch together. Two years later, we started a new church. Baptized over 44 rich people. Amen. He told me that you cannot reach those people. <laughs> My question is, how much do our church members pray for their neighbors? How much do they get involved in being a blessing for the neighbors? Amen. 